Based upon that, this is how we're supposed to live now. Wherefore, he says, so when you're going through problems, remember who you are in Jesus Christ. And then practice what you have in Jesus Christ. Now listen, our behavior, okay, how we live our lives every day, how you live out life, our behavior is the result of what you believe about who God is and what He has done for you. We do what we do because of who we are and who you believe yourself to be based upon who you believe God to be. And what I want to try to do today is I want to draw our attention to three commands that we find in verse 13, I believe it's verse 15, and then verse 17. And then we'll look at the other scriptures as well following that. But I want to touch on, there's three commands here, three main commands that, that Peter gives us um, that we find here. The first one you'll note is to have hope, it's to be hopeful. The second one, verse 15, would be to be holy. And then the third one, if you drop down to verse 17, really, we'll get into this a little bit more, but there's, there's an idea here of having a full devotion to living our lives right here in this world. It's kind of this idea of being wholehearted in life. Not just being lazy about living, not just trying to get through life, but living on purpose, on mission for Jesus and for the Lord. So uh, we'll talk about that as well. And so there's those main three commands. We're, we're going to look at each of those, and then we're going to look at some supporting uh, scripture as well surrounding that. Peter doesn't just, guys, he doesn't just tell us um, to be hopeful and, and to uh, be holy and to be, you know, fully devoted or wholehearted in our walk. He tells us how. And that is key because it's one thing to have head knowledge of what you're supposed to do, but it's another thing altogether to actually put it into practice and apply it to your life every day. When you get up in the morning, what do you do to make this, make this happen in your life? What do you do to be holy? He said, well, I God's the only one that's holy. No, no, he says, be holy for I am holy. That's a command to be holy. It's a responsibility on our part. So how do you go about doing that? And Peter tells us. But so let's, let's look at the first one real quick, to be hopeful. The idea of being hopeful, to have hope. This is the first thing we're called to do in verse 13. And that's, that's not easy to do. And I understand it's not easy to do when, when we live in our society right now that seems to be imploding. Uh, and many Christians are caving into the cultures around them and they're compromising. They're compromising their faith in God and, and God's moral law, God's word. They're compromising this for the sake of, I don't know, more Facebook likes or something. I'm not sure. I thought that was a dog that actually just <laughs> crawled out behind the pew. It's a cute little baby back there, but I thought, somebody's got a dog in the church. <laughs> I just had to share that real quick. <laughs> that was funny. That was good. If you were me, if you could only saw what I saw. <laughs> All right, Ben, bring it back. Hold on. It's not easy in our society. Things are going crazy around us, you know, but we're called to consider something. We're called to consider the return of Jesus Christ when we're being clobbered by news reports. Christians are, are just, are, they're being persecuted. And when we're going through personal struggles and personal trials, he says, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You and I are supposed to hope in our trials and struggles. We are to hope for and look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's something to be hopeful for. And this basically means that we are, we are literally to set our hope completely and totally and utterly in Him. You know, hope refers to the absolute certainty of a future good, a future event that's going to take place. You don't hope for bad things to happen. That's not hope. You're hoping for a future good. And that future good is the return of Jesus. The idea is, is great expectation. You're looking forward to the return of Jesus. And that's exactly what Peter is telling us here. 
That's what he's telling the Christians back then who were struggling and being persecuted. They were to have a great expectation. You ever heard this saying? Other men see only a hopeless end, but the Christian rejoices in an endless hope. You ever heard that, that saying? Things, yeah, things are bad now, but you just need to hang on because there's some good that's coming. It's on its way. Romans 4 and 18 uses a great example uh, for us um, that uh, basically about Abraham to kind of help us have hope even because Abraham did that. He had hope even when it seemed hopeless when, when the Bible says in Romans 4 and 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed he had hope. He believed. He was expecting it, it, something great to happen, a future good to take place. Uh, I don't know if you saw this in there or not when you were reading that verse uh, in, uh, in 1 Peter, though, the very beginning. I don't know if you saw, again, what we're to hope, put our hope in or to set our hope on. Um, we are to focus on something important there. And the Bible there says in verse 13 that it's grace, isn't it? It's the grace that is coming when Jesus returns. That's what we're to set our hope on as well. Sometimes we get so caught up and, and really fearful. I mean, I, I, wanna, I want you guys to be honest with me. When everything started happening with this whole pandemic and you couldn't find toilet paper, Was anybody just a little bit of fear creeping in? A little bit of fear trying to creep up. What's going to happen next? Oh, I mean, is it going to be food next? Am I not going to be able to get any meat products? Or maybe you're a vegetarian, so maybe you're not going to get fresh vegetables. Or whatever the case is, there's a little bit of fear that might creep up in some people's lives and, and in their hearts. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's where you were at or not, but the Bible says we are to focus on the grace of that is uh, through Jesus Christ. And sometimes, again, we get caught up in this in our world today. And maybe even now, you get, you get a little fearful when you see some of the news stations out there and the things that they're reporting. And, and trust me, and I think you all know, we don't need to be putting all of our trust in those news stations and some of the clippings that they're putting out there. Uh, but again, you, you can be fearful. You can let that kind of creep in. And uh, that's unfortunate. We shouldn't be doing that. Don't be putting our hope and our trust in a society around us that is lost. A society that needs Jesus. My friends, Jesus is bringing blessings with him when he returns. He is bringing blessings with him for those who are born again. I like how John Ortberg puts it. He said, God sees with utter clarity who we are. He is undeceived as to our warts and wickedness. But when God looks at us, that is not all he sees. He also sees who we are intended to be, who we will one day become. You know, friends, I'm afraid that many followers of Christ have lost their longing for his return. When's the last time you thought about and looked forward to the return of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you right now, there are events that are lining up one after another for the imminent rapture of believers, and we should be looking for it every single day. There should be a longing for the return of, of Jesus and the rapture of the church. You know, in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, it says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When I think about all of the things that are going on around us, not just in our country, you know, we're not the center of this, of this universe, America. When I think about the things that are going on in the world that are going on, I'm reminded, my, my mind goes to this scripture uh, that I wanted to share today in Luke 21, 10 to 11. Many of you probably are aware of this and know this. When, when uh, Jesus said this, he said then, talking about the end times, Jesus was talking about later on the end times, he said, then said he unto them, Jesus said unto them, nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, meaning many different places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. You know, 1 Timothy 4 and 1 says, In latter times, some will depart from the faith, 
And we'll see more and more people controlled by their lusts and passions. According to 2 Peter 3 and 3, scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. Not according to God's word any longer. Not according to God, but according to their own lusts. Scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. My, my friends, Christians and church leaders and pastors falling away from the faith. Church denominations as a whole embracing homosexual marriages, blessing them, conducting those ceremonies. I do not care what society or man's philosophy tells you about sin, homosexuality, unnatural union, it is not in God's word. God speaks against it. He calls it an abomination for a woman to lie down with a woman and a man to lie down with a man. Abomination means unnatural. And he says, of which will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't get any more plainer than that. And yet we, for whatever reason, some denominations are out there blessing that. I believe that we are in the last days, described in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. It says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be, listen to this description, you tell me, you try and tell me otherwise, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. Oh my goodness. Incognent, fierce, despisers. Listen. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. You know what happens when a person or a community or a nation sets their hope in the return, the reality, the return of Jesus coming back? Do you know what the result is? The result is a purifying effect in how a person lives. You see it in 1 John 3 and 3, And every man that hath this hope in him, God, Christ, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And if you just back up a few verses, we can read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, and now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You know, whenever I go and do appraisals, uh, I set up an appointment with someone, and you know, I say, okay, I need about an hour window of time, I need to be able to get there, and I'm going to go through the house, and they say, are you going to have to take pictures? And I say, yeah, the bank requires pictures of every single room. And they say, oh, goodness, okay, I need to schedule out further. Why do you think they need to schedule out further? If you've had your home appraised, what happens? You get to cleaning, don't you? Everybody wants a clean house. They start vacuuming and cleaning up everything. When you start to consider that Jesus is the one that's coming over, that Jesus is returning, and he's going to look at your heart, he's going to look at your life, what are you going to start doing? You're going to start cleaning up, aren't you? It has a purifying effect when we consider the return of Jesus Christ. So what do we see? Well, we see next what happens is Peter gives a couple of ways that we can remain hopeful. There's a couple of things here. If you look in verse 13, he begins with kind of an unusual thing, uh, but it has to do with being intentional in your mind. You're, you're going to be intentional about this. Okay, so he begins with wherefore, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. And you say, I didn't know my mind had loins. I agree. 
So what is he saying here? Well, there's a little bit of background. You see, in the first century, men would wear these long, flowing robes. So whenever it was time to get to work, whenever it was time to go to war, whenever they needed to take off running somewhere, or they had to, maybe they had to defend themselves, or maybe they were in a wrestling match, I don't know, whatever it might be, they would, they would actually take their robe and they would bring it up and they would tuck it into their belt so that it wouldn't get in the way. That was called girding up their loins. The loins were the long flowing robe. They would gird those up to get them out of the way. The idea here is to be ready to respond to God in instant obedience. When God says jump, you say how high. You gird the loins of your mind and you do what he said to do. And we see a lot of these examples in the Old Testament even. In Exodus, God's people were told to be ready to move during the Passover. And thus he says, and thus you shall eat it with your belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat this in haste. He said, be ready to go. Even when you're eating, you need to be ready to hightail it out of there. Nothing was to hold them back when it was time to, to, to leave, to move forward. In 1 Kings 18.46, Elijah says he girded up his loins and he ran ahead of Ahab. Jesus told his followers to be ready for the master's return. In Luke 12 and 35, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Keep them burning. Be ready. He says, be ready. When Ephesians 6 and 14, we're told to tie everything together with the belt of truth, which is the word of God. Why? So we can fight spiritual battles. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. I don't know if there's anything more important to do today, because there are so many lies out there, so many counterfeits. You need to be ready. So he says, gird up the loins of your mind. John MacArthur says that girding up uh, our minds is like it's kind of like trying to, or, or basically tying up our loose thoughts. Tying up our loose thoughts. Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the great uh, uh, preachers of, of our time, well, not our time, but back in the day, he said it kind of in his words, we're pulling ourselves together. Get yourself pulled. You and I might say it's time to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Because to be honest with you, mental laziness almost always leads to moral compromise. Loose thinking leads to loose living. So what is it? What is it the 2 Corinthians in chapter 10, verse 5 tells us? What does it say there? To take every thought captive, doesn't it? To take every thought captive. That, that means you can't just let your mind and your thoughts just run wild. Why? Because it will eventually lead to moral compromise. So take those thoughts captive. We are supposed to guard against Letting garbage come into our minds and, and instead to focus on those things that are going to build us up. And that's why scripture memory, uh, memorization, that's why it's so important. That's why it's, it's important to apply yourselves to rem, uh, remembering scripture so that when you're faced with something that maybe you're struggling with, you have found what God's word says about it. You take that with you. You're faced with it during the day and then you're, then, boom, it's there. The Holy Spirit reminds you of that scripture. And it helps you defeat that. But there's another thing he says to do. So not only to be intentional, but he also says to be sober-minded. To be sober. Now, to be sober or literally, literally it means to be wineless. Now while scripture warns, certainly warns against alcohol, uh, Peter's main concern, uh, I would say that that we don't live under the influence of the world around us. Don't become intoxicated by your emotions and the things that are going on in your life. To be sober means to be clear-headed about things. It means to be clear-headed, to keep, keep your faculties fully operational. So I guess you could say there's a two-fold meaning there, isn't there? I wonder, are you clear-headed? Right now, are you sober minded so that Jesus can call on you for service and you'll be able to obey in a moment? You'll be ready to be obedient to Him. You know, Jesus warns us in Luke 12 and 31 
He says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with what? Carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Because you see the day can come unexpectedly. And you're not ready. And so he says, be so reminded. Are you alert? I mean, are you really alert to the dangers around you? Are you, you better, don't think that the enemy is sleeping. Please don't think that he is resting. He is hard at work. He is hard at work. I mean, look at 1 Peter 5 and 8. You know this well. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. See, the reality is, the world that we live in, this world, this world wants me. It desires to have my devotion. It desires to have my worship. It wants me. It's wooing me with the pleasures of power and fame and fortune. Our culture, guys, our culture provides the absolute perfect distraction from what's really important in our lives. It lures us away with, with these empty lusts and, and beliefs and different religions out there. Counterfeit religions. They're religions. They're not, they're not relationships with God. They're just man-made religions. A bunch of, I got to do this, and I got to do this, and then I can get to heaven. And that's not what Christianity is. It's a relationship with God. And you know what? All this stuff in the world, it may, it may not seem organized. It may seem kind of chaotic. But behind the chaos and behind all of that disorder, there's an enemy pulling the strings. You have to understand that there is such thing as spiritual warfare. And it is going on every day. If you're sleeping, it doesn't matter. That doesn't mean he's sleeping. And he's pulling the strings. It's easy to overlook. It's easy to overlook the fact that we are targeted. We have been marketed with endless strategies to do what? Capture your time. Capture your energy. Capture your money. The world wants your worship for one reason. And it's not to make you happy. It's so that you will then not worship the one who deserves to be worshipped. So we're called to be hopeful. Hopeful for the return of Jesus. But we're also commanded to be hopeful. And I want you to look at verses 15 to 16 with me. We see this in, in 15 to 16. But as he which had called you is holy. As he which has called you with holy, so be ye holy in what? In all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Now this word, that little three letter word there, but, indicates there's a contrast. So when you're reading scripture, you see that word, you might go, okay, there's a contrast. And you might want to look for it. And you might want to try to figure out what that contrast is. We need to be hopeful. No doubt we need to be hopeful by being intentional in our minds and living sober lives. But there's more than that. We must avoid sin. The idea here is, again, there's a contrast. Avoid sin, but also you can enjoy your life. You can no doubt enjoy living lives that are pleasing to God. So our standard here, this is the key. What is your standard for being holy? What standard do you use on a daily basis to determine whether or not you are being holy? Is this action? Is this my words? What is the standard that determines for you whether or not that's holy? It should be God. It should be His Word. It should be Oprah. It should be Dr. Phil. It, sh it should be God. God should be the standard. His word should be our standard for living the way that we're supposed to live. And so the Bible says, for God is holy, so we must be holy as well. To be holy, you might be saying, well, what is, what is holiness? You know, we're going to get to that. 
to be holy, here in this scripture, there's a sense of urgency in it, okay? And I need us to understand this. There's a sense of urgency. And because sometimes it's hard to get our minds wrapped around holiness, but basically it means that we are to reflect who God is. In your life, how you live, what you do, everything about you, should be a reflection of God. That would be a perfect description of holiness. Because we know that God is holy, so we are then to be holy. How do we do that? Try to reflect God in our lives. Okay, that's really what it means. It's interesting, J.B. Phillips, he, he put it like this. He said, be holy in every department of your life. Meaning holiness is not something to be compartmentalized. You can't say, well, my holiness, well, I go to church on Sunday morning. And then you leave here, and then you get down, driving down the road, and all of a sudden there's a, uh, somebody else who uh, cuts you off, and then all of a sudden it's okay not to be holy anymore. <laughs> It'd be a really good idea to do something that we, we like to call practicing the presence of God in your life. I remember years ago, I'm talking years ago, guys. I don't know if you guys remember that, that the, the dummy that you could put in your car with you, in your passenger seat that you drive around with, and so that everybody else around you, they would see that they would think somebody else is in the car with you, so you're not alone. You guys remember that? So, think about it. So, Jesus is your passenger now, not the dummy. Jesus is your passenger. You know, a lot of people are afraid to sin that secret sin. You would never do that in the church, would you? You wouldn't come and sit in the back row, I'm not picking on the back row people, but you certainly wouldn't come in the front row, but you wouldn't even go in the back row and practice that secret sin. And yet when we leave this place, we act like God doesn't leave and go with us. Like He's not in our car with us anymore. He's, he's in church, but he's, he's not at home. And when no one else is around, that also means that God is no longer around. Practice the presence of God in your life. There's a sense of urgency that we should have. And so what I mean by this, not compartmentalizing the idea of holiness in your life, is that you should be holy in your kids, guys, girls, young people, when you're gaming. You should be holy with the kind of games that you're playing. You should be holy. Adults, when we're voting, we should be asking God who we should vote for. We should be holy in our voting. Uh, TV watching, internet consumption, on your phone, dating relationships, you should be holy. Christians, the Bible is very clear not to be unequally yoked. You should be dating believers. In your marriage, you should be holy. When you're hanging out with people, you should be holy. The kind of music that you listen to, you should be holy. In your sports, how you play the game, you should be holy. Be holy at home, in your neighborhood, at work, at school, in your thoughts. I, I guess it could have been easier if I just said be holy in everything you do. But I, don't, I think we just, we just compartmentalize that little thing, too. We'll just say, in everything I do, okay, I'll be holy. And then you go in all these other areas, you're not holy. So I wanted to make a person. Now you might then naturally say, okay, well how do we grow in holiness? How do I take that step? You, you're telling me I should be holy, but how do I take the steps in growing in holiness in verse 14? And this is important because you don't just drift into holiness, guys. This isn't something that happens, just kind of happens because you have, to, you have to go after it. And so in verse 14, it begins like this. As obedient children. You notice that? As obedient children. Ah, so we are to live our lives trying to please God. We are to be obedient to God. In biblical language, to be a child of something is actually to be controlled by that something. And the word for obedient means, it means here under, here under. It's a picture of, of somebody who submits and serves someone that is an authority over you. So you are then being obedient to God. When God says in His Word, this is a good thing, this is a bad thing, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do, to be obedient, to place yourself under His authority as an obedient child and obey what He says. That is how you live a holy life. 
And there's something else he continues on, and basically the idea here is not to live the way you used to live. He says, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Now listen, the phrase not fashioning, this is actually a present tense uh, phrase. What it means is something that is going on right now. Something that's going on right now. It's present tense. Okay? Stop the activity that is already in progress in your life right now. He says, don't do that anymore. Stop doing that. Romans 12 and 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's right. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its little mold. Let God remold. Let God reshape. Let Him renew your thoughts and your minds. Now this word here, lusts, oftentimes we, we automatically think of lusts and we go right towards the idea of some type of sexual immorality. While it may include that, lust is, is, it, this is it refers to a strong desire. It's a strong desire to do or to secure something. And so that could be for anything. You can, you can lust after money. You can lust, yes, after an individual. You can lust after a lot of different things. James 1 and 14 calls us to control these things, control those lusts. He says each one of you is tempted when you're drawn away by your own desires and you're enticed. And remember, it's Peter in his letter that believers are going through struggles. They're going through trials. And when you're hurting, guess what? That's when it's easy to let down the guard, isn't it? It's when you've been discouraged, when you're tired, when you're disappointed, when you're down and out, you just don't feel like there's any hope. That's when you let your guard down, and that's when the enemy knows. As a roaring lion, the animal that they go after is the one that's not paying attention. It's the weak one. It's the tired one. It's the one that got a little bit too close to the tall grass that he's hiding in. Job knew that he was vulnerable in that area. You know what Job said about himself? What he did in chapter 31, verse 1 of Job? It says that he made a covenant with his eyes not to look lustfully after a female. Guys, how many, how many of you need to do that? Ladies, how many of you need to do that? Basically, the idea is don't go back to doing and living the same way you had been. Whatever's going on now, change it. Change it. Don't live, but don't fashion yourself after the world. So we are to be hopeful for his return. What does that do? Man, that has a purifying effect. But we should also be holy because he says he is holy, we should be holy. And then finally, let's be fully devoted. Let's have a passion for this life that God has given us. Let's live our lives wholeheartedly, not in a lazy kind of way. Look at verse 17. And if ye call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work. Oh, there it is. Judgeth according to every man's work. Past the time of your sojourning. This time is we're passing through, right? Here in, in, he says sojourning. He says to do this in fear. Now listen, it is great that we're invited to, you know, to, to call on our Father for whatever we need. We can do that. But we also need to remember that he's our judge. <laughs> We'd all be good. We'd do good to, to just remember that fact. Yes, we can call on him, but remember who's our judge. God's our judge. He's our father. We should have a healthy fear of him. We have a relationship with him, but we must also revere him. We need to respect him. We see here that, that, that you know, what we do actually matters. While we're, we're justified by faith, absolutely, in Jesus Christ, we're actually rewarded according to our works. He says that he's going to do that, doesn't he? He says, and if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judge it according to every man's work. You and I are going to be judged for what we've done, our work. 
And because of that, we are supposed to probably, it'd be a good idea to conduct ourselves accordingly, right? So go back to verse 15. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now this word conversation actually carries with it the idea of all conduct. Not just what you say, but it's, it's what you do, you say, it's, it's everything. So we need to understand that we can, we can say that, that God wants us to be completely holy. Leonard Ravenhill, a um, gentleman once said, The greatest miracle that God can do today is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world, make that man holy, put him back in an unholy world, and then keep him holy in it. That would be a miracle. My friends, we as Christians are called to live on mission for Christ. Fully devoted because, I'll tell you the truth here, the depth of our devotion, I want you to hear this, the depth of your devotion will determine your kingdom impact. The more you're devoted to God, the more impact for eternity you're going to have on this earth. Acts chapter 2 and 42 says that the first followers of Jesus, they devoted themselves. That's what it says. They devoted themselves. And that's why their enemies later on in Acts chapter 17, 6, they said basically that those Christians, those followers, they turned the world upside down. It's because they were devoted. It's not because they were lazy Christians. It's not because they came to church on Sunday morning. It's because when they left their places of worship, they lived on mission for God. They were fully devoted to Him. They were fully devoted. And that is what the church needs today. To be fully devoted. Not afraid to lose your life. Because if you do, you're going to lose it anyways, as Jesus said. But actually be okay with losing your life for His sake. And you'll find it. I think the biggest problem that Christianity has had today, and American Christians today, is that they're afraid to lose their life. And as a result, they're losing it. I'm sorry, my mind is... I'm trying to bring myself back here. We should expect spiritual growth in this area of holiness because that's what God expects. And if you were to look at verses 18 to 21, there's a few, there's actually four reasons. I don't have time to go into them all this morning. Um, I was hoping to try and get through them all, but there's some things that, uh, some reasons why we should be devoted to holiness, reasons why he gives us there, but this idea of really being wholehearted about pursuing holiness in our lives, and one of those reasons in verse 18, you can kind of read it on your own if you'd like, but the idea there is that you're actually saved. When you get saved, you're saved from living a life just aimlessly. You've been saved for a plan and a purpose, and that is a great thing when when he says, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with, it, with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Listen, you have been redeemed. Means that God has purchased your freedom by paying a ransom price. And so guess what? We no longer have to stumble around aimlessly in life. Because we have been set free and given a new direction, a new purpose, a new aim, if you will. But the other thing that we notice there in verse 19 is that you've involved the blood of Christ. Jesus is your substitute for your sin. So again, he's the Lamb of God. He's the sacrificial substitute. He's the one that takes away the sins of the world. It's not anything that we can do. 1 Corinthians 6 and 20 says that, that God bought us with the price of his Son. And that because of that, we are then to glorify him in our bodies. We are actually, the Bible says, to live our lives as living sacrifices unto Him. Think about that. So God wants us, since we have been bought with the blood of Jesus, we have been saved, He says, now, the only thing you can do is now live your life as a living sacrifice to God. 
Another reason is because God's eternal plan actually involves us. If you look at verse 1, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. God has planned it before the foundation of the world. That he was going to send his son Jesus, and that you and I would have that opportunity to be saved. I mean, Jesus himself prayed in 17 and 24 of, of John, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. That's what he said. And I don't want you to miss the last two words there. God's eternal plan was for you. It was for you. But it doesn't get activated unless you're born again. Unless you accept Christ. The last thing that a reason to be fully devoted is because your faith and your hope are actually rooted in the resurrection. It's rooted in the resurrection. Because I hope it is. I hope yours is. I mean, if you know Christ, then you can trust in Him through your trials. If you know Jesus, you can literally put your trust and faith in Him. Verse 21, Who by Him do believe in God, that raised Him up from the dead, and gave Him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. So since Jesus died for us, since Jesus was raised for us, and since Jesus ascended to heaven for us, he will also come back for us. You can put your full faith in him. You can be fully devoted to him because of what he's done for us. My friends, it's still important to make a commitment to Christ. And I wonder if you're ready to do that today. Are you ready to hold on to hope? Are you ready to go after personal holiness in your life? Are you determined to be fully devoted followers of Jesus? I'm here to tell you that if you are, but you have reservations, you need to know that Jesus will take you just the way that you are. You don't have to try and clean things up to come to Him. He already knows. He does the cleaning for you. But as Christians, we do have a responsibility because of what Jesus has done. And our responsibility is to be hopeful, to be holy, and to be fully devoted to Him. I hope you'll make that commitment today. I want you to bow people a word of prayer as our worship team comes forward today and close up. If you're here today, maybe you have some areas of your life that have been compartmentalized in this area of holiness. And you say, you know, I need to, I need to make some adjustments there. Maybe you're here today that uh, and you're saying, you know, I've never even accepted Christ into my heart and life. You desire to make that decision as well. I encourage you to make that choice, to make that decision this morning. Heavenly Father, today we thank you and we praise you for you are holy. For your word says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is, was, and is to come. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is speaking even now to people's hearts. And Father, today I ask that if there are those that are here that need to do business with you, that today they would not fail to take advantage of this moment when you're speaking to their heart. Or if they're here today and they've never accepted your son Jesus, put their faith, hope, and trust in Him. I pray that they would not let this moment pass by. That they would just surrender their life to You and put their trust in who Your Son is and what He has done for them. That You sent Your Son Jesus to die for all of our sin. And then You tell us that all we have to do 
is believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for us and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and that you have raised him from the dead. And we can be saved. So, Father, today, if there are those that are here that need to make those decisions, whatever they might be, I pray that they would do that right now. As we begin with a closing song, we always open up the altars. Father, I ask that you would just speak to people's hearts. And give them boldness and courage to come forward and just kneel down. Kneel down before you and just say, Father, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you. I want to surrender my heart and life to you. Please forgive me my sin. Come into my heart and life and be my Lord and Savior. Help me to live this day forward. Help me to live for you. As I turn away and repent of my old life so I won't live like that anymore, I will live for you. If there are those that desire to come forward, Father, today, I pray that you would encourage them to do that. We thank you, Father. We praise you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with us today as we sing. As I said, if you feel the need to come forward, we encourage you to do so. And uh, do business with God this morning. Amen. Amen.
Father, we thank you that you give us holiness, you give us faithfulness, you give us righteousness, and when we need it, you give us brokenness. God, I pray that you would be uh, the one that brings all those things to us. We can look to you and 